Escape from Tarkov is a hardcore, first-person looter shooter where players compete against each other in an ultra-competitive, cutthroat environment to survive. Uh-oh. So, you know, just like every other FPS on the market. It's overdone. All the murder just isn't as exciting as it used to be, you know? So what if instead of killing other people for sport, I just made it so I wanted to kill myself instead? And so, I decided I would drop my gun, cease the violence, and begin a new, peaceful way of life, as I found out if it was possible to be escaped from Tarkov as a pacifist. Now, before we get into it, let's lay down some of the ground rules here so there's no confusion. Rule one, no hurting anyone. That's it, those are the rules. You get all that? Because I'm not explaining it again. But I'm sure you're wondering, just what is there to do in a first person shooter if the first thing you do upon seeing a person is not to shoot? Well, unlike other more fast paced shooters, which are constantly forcing players into engaging combat scenarios in order to provide them with a constant supply of small dopamine hits, games such as Fortnite, a game which is so horrifically terrified of losing your attention for even a mere moment that they literally added a back bling that is constantly playing Family Guy funny moments into the game in a cynical attempt to keep you playing just a little bit longer. In Tarkov, we're not just here to bounce from one dopamine hit to the next, killing simply for the exhilarating jubilance of unfettered violence. That's just a nice little bonus we get on the side. You see, Tarkov is a methodical, slow-paced game that takes place in a strange alternative reality where things aren't going too well in Russia. Hard to imagine, I know. But as a result of the troubles, people are now killing for a reason, the best possible reason, monetary gain. For you see, as society is broken down, people have become desperate and are willing to pay exorbitant prices for previously mundane supplies, such as light bulbs, electronics, and alcohol. Especially alcohol. People will pay a lot of money for alcohol. Alcoholism in Russia? <sighs> Hard to imagine, I know. But as any good economist will tell you, where there is demand, supply must be produced to profit from it. You see, Tarkov is not so much a first-person shooter as it is a first-person business simulator, where we take the role of a former private military contractor, PMC for short, who must venture into the anarchy that is the former territory of Tarkov in order to get our grubby little hands on as much floor junk as possible, deal with the competition, and extract from the location at one of your randomly assigned extraction points. Now I'm going to do my favorite extract, um... Which is from my body, I'm dead. With the now secured product, which we can then sell to our trader contacts in exchange for those sweet, sweet rubbly doos. All this while contending with the local population of now unwashed, feral, semi-intoxicated Russians, simply referred to as scabs. And yes, what you've been listening to this entire time is a single 30 second voice line that they will repeat ad nauseum until you shut them the fuck up. However, unlike many other games in which there is simply loot to collect, in Tarkov there also exists loot to lose. For anything you bring into raid will be lost upon your death, becoming available for other players to pick up themselves. Typically, this leads to a sort of risk versus reward scenario, as more expensive guns are typically better performing, giving you an advantage in combat, while in turn, at the same time, opening yourself up to greater loss should you fall in battle. However, as a pacifist, I, right off the bat, find a boon. As there is no need for such brutish weapons, I can forego bringing such tools of sin along with their associated risks into conflict with me, as we queue up for our first trip to customs. Get a gun. No! We're gonna get every quest I can before I shoot someone. We're gonna see the limits of Tarkov pacifism at play here. I'm at my limit. <laughs> <laughs> If you're just starting off in Tarkov, Customs is the perfect map to get accustomed to the game. <laughs> it doesn't have the best loot in the game, but it has something far more valuable to offer instead. Simplicity. See, while on other levels in this game it is extraordinarily easy to get lost because everything looks the fucking same, Customs is essentially an open air hallway where all you have to do to successfully extract is go to the opposite side of the map you spawned on. Frankly, you would have to be a special kind of stupid to get lost here. And so naturally, I immediately separated from my group, lost track track of where I was, and while I was looking at a map of the level online, got a taste of what this pacifism run was going to be like. Ah, oh, I got shot. <laughs> I can't even hear the gunshots. <laughs> Check this. Dude, the whole squad's walking by me right now. Yeah, they, I just saw them walk through your bush. In retrospect, I probably should have savored this near miss more than I did, because this would be one of the few times I successfully hid from players after they found me. Most of my interactions typically went something like this instead. Drop the gun. Drop the gun. Uh, I don't have a gun. Okay, what do you mean? No, see, there's no gun on me. I'm friendly. <laughs> God damn it. But that was a problem for later. Because after picking up some floor candy and successfully extracting for my first raid, it was time to get my reward and to make a decision about what I actually meant when I said beat 
Escape from Tarkov as a pacifist. You see, despite being titled Escape from Tarkov, this game doesn't actually allow you to do that. You're stuck here. The only way to truly escape Tarkov is to uninstall the game. And if I go for even a moment without some sort of entertainment to null my senses and distract me from the lucidity of human consciousness, I start to have the bad thoughts. So uninstalling the game wasn't going to be an option. However, Tarkov doesn't actually have any sort of overarching wing condition at all. Like any other online multiplayer game, you're simply expected to play match after match, experiencing the same horrors of war day after day, with the only true winner being the corporation whose product we've decided to spend all of our limited time on Earth with. What I'm saying is, we're going to have to come up with our own goal here. Fortunately, we does not mean me, because the community uh, has near universally decided that the ultimate end goal of the game is to acquire the Kappa Secure Container, a special 3x4 container where anything you put in it will be kept, even if you die. Other players cannot take out what you've already put in it, and you can safely retrieve what you've put in it back on the main menu even if you die. If you've ever played Minecraft, it's essentially an ender chest you carry with you at all times. There are smaller secure containers in the game as well. You start off with a 2x2 one if you buy the basic version of the game, and a 3x3 one if you bust out the big boy box and give Daddy Battlestate Games a whopping $150 for the Edge of Darkness edition. But what kind of idiot would be dumb enough to pay that much money for a minor in-game advantage? Look, does it make the game easier? Yes. But I'm going to suffer enough on this challenge as it is, and I'm not giving the Russians another $50 for a new account to make it even harder for myself. Regardless, we had our goal. We would obtain the Kappa Secure container without hurting a single person. But how do you actually get it? The Kappa Secure container is given as a reward for completing almost every major quest line in the game. Quests are given to you by traders. There's nine of them in the game, although one of them is, uh, a little tricky to get to. So we're only going to be using these eight. All right, so with a plan in place, our first quest we need to complete complete in order to obtain the Kappa Secure container is kill five scabs on customs. We will not be obtaining the Kappa Secure container. Oh, well, shit. What am I supposed to do now? Ah, uh, wait, I have an idea. Since we're not allowed to leave Tarkov, we might as well make it a nice place to live. This is your hideout, an old abandoned bomb shelter, which, much like myself, is a filthy, abandoned, empty, neglected husk of what it once was, and is extremely uncomfortable to be around. Unlike me, however, it's got some potential. You see, this loot we've been picking up isn't just for selling, but can be reinvested into our base, providing us with upgrades that will help us along the way. Want some lighting? Use a lighter to light some candles. Need some heating? Use some matches to start a literal trash fire, which helps us replenish energy. Why can't I just use the same lighter for both things? Don't worry about it. There are dozens of potential upgrades we can make. I would get every single base upgrade in Tarkov without harming a soul. Other than myself, of course. However, doing anything more complicated than lighting fires in this unventilated hole in the ground is going to be more difficult, requiring both rarer materials and the expertise of the traders, who not only require payment, but also a certain level of relationship development before they're willing to assist you in upgrading your base. Your reputation with the traders can only be increased by doing quests for them. You want to sleep in a bed instead of a cot? Sorry, buddy. Not for sale unless you grab Ragman some sunglasses from the mall first. Want an air filtration? unit, Skier's gonna need some white armor first, and scabs need to die in order for you to pick it off their dead bodies. But the quest doesn't specify that I have to be the one to kill them, so I can just find already dead bodies and simply remove their clothes for my own personal gain. Is it moral to steal off of a dead corpse? Of course. It's called recycling. It's good for the environment. In fact, you should be ashamed for trying to bury this shit. You're really just littering if you think about it. You're the asshole here, not me. Want some clean water to go with this ice? Run three miles with a broken leg first. That one's not a joke. Jaeger's just an asshole. Half of his quests are just attempts to get you killed. He hates you and wants nothing to do with you. In fact, when the game starts, he won't even talk to you. You see, only six of the traders will actually give you quests to begin with. Jaeger and Peacekeeper require you to run quests for other traders before they'll give you anything themselves. And, in order to talk to Jaeger, we would need to complete a quest for Mechanic to locate Jaeger's hideout in woods. Now remember when I said that every map aside from customs was easy to get lost in? Well, Woods is the worst offender, being a massive level with the same four trees copy-pasted 14,000 times. There's a few landmarks to keep you on track, 
the mountain, the Yusa camp, this village. But again, we are in the woods. The only thing you can see 90% of the time is the backside of a conifer. By the way, I don't know where else to put this in the video, so I'm just gonna jam it in here. Say the line, Woods Jack. Play Woods. I sure would. <laughs> I love this guy. The Tarkov community is some of the strangest memes I've ever seen in a game. I haven't decided if they're the best or the worst memes of any community, but they're without a doubt the most unhinged. To make things worse, Woods is absolutely covered in scavs, who I literally cannot defend myself from. Here's all the places on the map where they spawn, and here's where Jaeger's base is, right in the middle of a scav spawn. Fortunately for this quest though, I brought my friends as backup for me. Now you're probably asking, Doki, doesn't playing with your friends kind of ruin the challenge and make it too easy? In theory, yes. In practice, um... Oh shit, someone sees me! Oh, I would be worried about that guy. Say you! Fuck! God damn it! You got any, you got any splints? Yeah. Alright. <laughs> Fucking bitch! <laughs> hey, why don't you come and take this gas analyzer first? <laughs> why? I did a good deed and I got punished for it. Oh, oh, you're pushing top? Okay. Yeah, I'm pushing top. Oh, I just look, I look at the oh, that's me! <laughs> Oh my god, you killed him! <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> the laser pistol? Oh, it's just like Resident Evil. You bitch! <laughs> god damn it. It's a mixed bag, but worse than making the challenge easier, hiding behind people is fucking lame. It doesn't really fit the spirit of the challenge. So, starting after this quest, I made the decision that I would need to lay down some ground rules. This challenge was going to take a very long time. So for the sake of my mental health, I would, sometimes, still play with friends. Learning the maps, just grabbing some loot for some quick cash, that's fair game. Anyone can do that without getting into fights. There's a whole strategy called ratting that's based around it. In fact, it's one of the two main playstyles of the game. Frankly, when half the player base is already doing it, I'm not proving anything by doing it myself. But when the time comes to actually do something difficult, to run a hard quest that would actually require me to go somewhere or do something, at times when any sane man would bring a gun, I would do it alone, just to prove it was possible to live peacefully in this anarchic hellscape of a place. To achieve this though, I would need to strategize. Hiding was always effective when all I had to do was loot, with nowhere I needed to go in particular. Alright, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Fuck. <laughs> Alright, good good. We can go now. But you cannot hide for most quests. You need to go places. Places that only other people with quests go to which is of course everyone, and they could be there at any time. So waiting isn't typically helpful there. You need to act, and I would act with the incredible power of persuasion. Hey, hey man, chill. Whoa, whoa, oh. It's not very chill of him. For the most part, people just see that I don't have a gun and decide to shoot me and take my stuff. But when faced with such violence, it is important to be the bigger man and just walk away. And I do mean that literally. Most people in this game are terrible shots. Hey man, uh, that was some bad aim, so I think we should just call it a draw. I quickly discovered that literally just running away will get me out of trouble 75% of the time. And honestly, that's really all the strategy I needed for the first part of this game. Things were actually starting off super smoothly. And of course it helps that most of the quests start off pretty easy as well. Find some painkillers for therapist? No sweat. Pack a lunchbox for Jaeger? Here you go, buddy. Have fun on your camping trip. The last drives for skier? These are actually pretty hard to find, but when you're wasting as much of your life running around looking for trash in a video game as me, it's not a question of if, but when you'll find them. At this point, my rep with traders was rising rapidly. All the basic necessities of my base were slowly coming online, and the first 10 or so levels on my character were quickly flying by. So quickly, in fact, that I uh, thought this challenge might be too easy, that it might not be much of a challenge at all. But, um, turns out, uh, that's because it wasn't supposed to be a challenge thus far. The beginning of this game is a facade, designed to make you feel like you're good at it, so that by the time the game actually starts throwing real challenges at you, they've already got you. You're committed, and you're gonna play it. Just look at the XP requirements for these levels. Level 1 to 2, you need a thousand. The amount of XP you get from a raid is determined by a number of factors, but if I spend a long enough time in raid to get enough loot, I can easily get more than that. Contrast this with level 14 to 15, which has a 26,465 experience requirement as 26 raids I not only need to survive and extract from, but also get enough loot while doing it as well. And when you count the fact that, you know, 
we don't always make it out. On average, I'm probably making about 700 XP per raid. Leveling up via normal gameplay was starting to become exceedingly difficult, and that's kind of my own fault. Typically, when you kill a player or a scav, you get a couple hundred XP, and killing four or five scavs in a raid is entirely normal. There's absolutely more XP available. I'm just choosing not to get it, and that's only going to become a bigger problem as we go forward. For some perspective, in order to build the solar farm, one of the final upgrades available to the player, you need to hit level 4 reputation with Peacekeeper, which requires your PMC to be level 37. In order to hit level 37 in this game, you need a grand total of over 1.8 million experience points. Making an average of 600 XP per raid, we're looking at, um, 2,639 raids. It takes about 25 minutes per raid, so that's, um, a very long time. Uh, and that's under slightly optimistic estimates as well. You do have to remember that sometimes in Tarkov, you will spend eight minutes waiting for a raid to start, only to be shot in the first 10 seconds and be sent back to the title screen with zero XP. So, uh, I needed to speed this up. Now, you do get XP for looting stuff, even if you drop it later. So for a while, I was just grabbing everything I could as quickly as I could, and just throwing it back onto the ground, simply for the XP. Put it back on the body. I did. I did put it back on the body. You like this? You like these strats? <laughs> I, I'm going to shoot you. Another thing I noticed is that I got XP for healing injuries. So every chance I could, I'd find some barbed wire and commit as much self-harm as humanly possible. If I could make my character bleed, that's even better. He would continuously lose HP over time. Normally, terrible. For me, however, fantastic. If you inject yourself with a Propotel regenerative stimulant, it will actually cancel out the bleeding. Not by stopping it, no, but instead by healing the HP you've lost from the bleed almost as soon as you take damage from it. This drug essentially gives you infinite blood, and more importantly, a small amount of XP every few seconds. And while this is theoretically a very good way to gain XP, and practically a very funny abuse of the game's mechanics, the first injection did leave me open to the dangers of receiving a second, more lethal injection, this time consisting of 10 cc's of hot lead delivered directly into my skull by XX Mommy Milkers X, three minutes into the raid, robbing me of any potential for significant XP gain. And Propitol is, um, very expensive. So instead of doing this again, I just, uh, stopped looting raids entirely. I would still do raids, mind you, just not for the loot, but instead primarily to assist my good friends, the traders. For the more observant members of the audience, you may have noticed that quests also typically reward XP as well. And while at lower levels, the amount of XP rewarded is so laughably low as to essentially be insignificant, as you get further into the game, the amount of XP you get increases exponentially. Obviously, being unable to do the first quest in some of these quest lines leaves me unable to access some of the later quests, and as we previously discussed, a lot of the quests I do have access to require me to commit harm to my fellow man. And so, it was at this point I realized I was going to be locked out of most of the quests in the game from Prapper and Jaeger. Peacekeeper, however, hadn't given me a single quest I couldn't do so far, because they hadn't given me any quests to begin with. Literally, every single quest with this man is locked behind another quest you have to do for Skier. Hey, I'm the Peacekeeper. I keep the peace. I need to see you kill seven men before I'll give you any work. How is that keeping the peace? The peace can't be broken if there's no one left to break it. Ayy. With all of Peacekeeper's quests locked beyond seven counts of premeditated homicide, we we're going to have to look elsewhere for our XP for now. But don't worry, I'd still figure out how to gain rep with him later. For now, however, this left me stuck with Therapist, Skier, Ragman, and Mechanic as the only people who would give me any quests that didn't require any violence. In fact, Mechanic and Therapist pretty much never asked me to kill anyone. Just bring them things. Does bringing Mechanic over a dozen customized weapons of war count as violating my pacifism clause? Of course not. Look, we have no way of knowing what he's doing with these guns in this war zone, and therefore, I cannot be held responsible for any acts of violence he may or may not commit with the supplies I've provisioned for him. What is important, however, is no matter how many guns I bring him, he keeps asking for more. Across this entire challenge, I was given 18 quests just to build him custom guns, and in exchange, not only did I receive an extreme amount of reputation with him, but also over 200,000 experience as well, or just under 12% of the total amount of XP needed to max out my hideout. And that's just from the gunsmith quest line. There's even more shit he's asking us to do. Best of all, some of these quests don't even require us to do anything. We just get rewarded for having certain skill levels. For those of you unfamiliar, Tarkov has a skill system similar to that of Skyrim's, in which your character has individual skills that can be leveled up. Unlike Skyrim, however, these skills don't make any fucking sense. 
I know. picked up squash and my charisma went up. I don't understand. Damn, then you sure picked that squash up. Why does squash increase my charisma? I don't know. What does charisma do? I don't care. The skill system is largely irrelevant to this challenge outside of a few select quests, such as Signal Part 4, which simply requires you to have a level 4 memory. I don't actually know how you increase memory, but since skills are gained passively, I didn't have to. Because by the time I was actually given Signal Part 4, I already had the prerequisite memory to complete it instantly, rewarding me with 20,000 rubles and 8,600 XP. However, to get such easy, brain dead quests like signal part four we were going to have to get our brains blown out a few dozen times doing other quests first you know like signal part one through three which will require us to go to a brand new area with half the loot of woods but double the scabs say the line shoreline jack play shoreline i sure would <laughs> i love this little guy Shoreline is a series of open fields that runs along, you guessed it, a sanitarium. This sanitarium contains most of the worthwhile loot on this map, and as a result, nearly everyone rushes in there and kills each other to death at the start of every raid. However, as I am above such violence, I would normally never visit and partake in such a brutish scene myself. What I am not above, however, is committing self-harm for monetary gain. And what is above that sanitarium is a couple of satellite dishes Mechanic will pay me to go check out. So, after affixing some GPS locators to some ambulances for therapists, I set off for the sanitarium, which, when I got to, I was almost immediately cornered in a shack by a player who, instead of blasting me and stealing all the armor off my body, he, without ever saying a single word, gave me a fire steal and went about his business. Now, I don't really have anything interesting to say about this encounter, and fire steals aren't even particularly rare loot. This really didn't affect my challenge in any way, shape, or form, but I want to express my gratitude. You are a beacon of hope in this dark world, and wherever you are, I hope you're doing well. Having been spared, I located the satellite dishes, extracted from the raid, and returned to Mechanic, who, upon hearing of my success, said, Wow, fantastic job. Now I'm gonna need you to do it again. I need you to put some signal jammers on these things too. This man really just gave me two quests in a row to go to the same place and do the same thing. Why didn't he just give me the signal jammers to begin with? In most games, this would be considered bad game design. In Tarkov, however, I am... Still going to call it bad game design, but double the quest does mean double the XP, so I can't complain too much. Especially since this quest unlocks further quests in another level that isn't the sniper infested shithole that is Shoreline, but instead on a map that is somehow even worse. Factory is essentially an abandoned crack den. It contains almost no loot, points of interest, or reasons to come. <laughs> okay, I am exaggerating a bit. Because it's not abandoned. There's a billion fucking scavs all over the place too. This is the smallest map in the game, and as a result, you will be constantly running into other players and scavs. I avoided this map entirely on my playthrough, other to complete some niche quests, such as the one I am currently on. Or Mechanic wants me to fix one of these circuit breakers for him. A fix which requires me to sit in place for 20 seconds. And then he wants me to do it a second time. I couldn't even handle the 30 second walk to one of these things after spawning in, let alone the 20 second fix where I wasn't even allowed to move. However, you can't shoot what you can't see. By putting on a pair of these nifty night vision goggles and going in during the pitch black of night, I could avoid conflict altogether. You see, at night, scavs can't see shit and so won't shoot you unless you get close. Other players could be wearing these goggles as well, but honestly, the vision with these things is pretty shit, and judging by the fact that I couldn't see any of them, they probably just couldn't see me either. In the end, it all worked out. Honestly, this might be the single smartest play I've made in this entire challenge. Or I just got lucky. Doesn't matter. Because, after finally completing enough quests, I was at long last level 15. Now you're probably wondering, what's so special about level 15? And that is because level 15 is when the real game finally begins. All that raiding, looting, questing, the first half of this video, that was all but a preamble to prepare you for when you finally gain access to the real game, the flea market. An unregulated, illegal space where real players can put up items they've found in raid for other players to purchase. A thriving black market? In Russia? 
Hard to believe, I know. And while the in-game lore may be that Russia has finally achieved the anarcho-capitalist dream of a totally unregulated market where medical goods such as a band-aid can go for as much as 2,000 rubles, the equivalent of 20 American dollars, the real-life Russians beyond Tarkov have stayed true to their communist roots and put some regulations on this market. And rule number one is never do business with a pansy bitch who can't survive a raid. Anything that is listed for sale must be tagged with the found in raid icon. This icon is awarded any item that you either craft and base yourself, or that you have managed to smuggle out of a raid alive. If you die, the items that you do manage to smuggle out via your secure container will not be granted found in raid status, and thus you will be unable to sell these on the flea market. In addition, particularly rare items, such as high-end ammo and base upgrade items, cannot be listed for sale at all. If you want those, you need to find them yourself. For everything else in the game though, once you've unlocked the flea market, you pretty much never need to sell things to traders ever again. You will typically gain a much greater profit cutting out the middlemen and selling your goods to the people who want them directly yourself. But like most Americans, more important to me than making money is spending it. You see, while I was questing and leveling up fairly quickly up to this point, I was never able to gain all the specific pieces of loot I needed to upgrade my base. But now that the only item I needed to find for my base was cold hard ruples, it was time to get spending and start building. The absolute pinnacle of Escape from Tarkov gameplay is trying to buy an item off the flea market 10 times, each time being told that it's already been sold to another player before actually buying one that's still there, being asked to complete a CAPTCHA for trying to buy too many items too quickly, only to see that in the time you took to complete the CAPTCHA, the item has already been sold to another player. When I was actually able to make purchases, however, I made a lot of them, and my base grew. An upgraded generator, med station, nutrition station, an intelligence center, a shooting range. This is nice. I was even able to finally take care of that massive crack in the wall of my base, which, turns out, had a massive buildup of water behind it. Water that is now constantly flowing into my base, giving me a permanent XP and energy debuff. Thank you, Battlestate Games. Very cool upgrade. I'm glad I spent 84,000 rubles on this. However, further upgrades to the crack in the wall reveal an entire second room into my base. A room that we upgraded to a gym, which, twice a day, provides a permanent increase to our strength stat, which in turn allows us to run faster, jump higher, and to carry more weight. Honestly, a pretty good return on investment once you get everything up and running. In Tarkov, only the hardest of men can survive. To maximize our combat readiness, we wear armor, even when lifting our weights. And yet, despite drinking a quart of milk every other raid, my PMC is actually kind of a weak-ass bitch. If you missed the QTE in this Xenoblade-ass weightlifting minigame, there is actually a 10% chance you break an arm. Now, I'm not the most athletic man, but I have been to a gym before, and I'm not exactly sure how you break an arm lifting a dumbbell. But the war waits for no man, so whenever this happens, I just slap a splint on that bad boy and keep going. With the base coming along nicely, the greatest limiting factor stopping me from progressing at this point was no longer the types of floor junk that I needed, but instead my reputation with the traitors. Mechanic, skier, and therapist were more or less on track to be where I needed them to be by the time I leveled up enough to increase their trader level. However, for Jaeger, Prapper, and especially Peacekeeper, I still was not getting enough quests for them. Sure, I was able to turn in one of my skier quests to Prapper for a little rep boost with him, but that really wasn't solving the problem. A problem that, up until now, I hadn't even really bothered to check on, and which upon actually checking online, I came to a troubling realization. I had fucked up. With the main quest that the traders give us, it is literally impossible to gain the reputation required with these three traders in order to complete the base without committing to violence. I had not anticipated this, but fortunately, where my planning failed, my sheer stupid luck would save me. For you see, this quest tree is not our only supply of quests. On top of this, Escape from Tarkov supplies players with three daily and one weekly quests for us to complete. These are randomly generated and assigned to any of the traders, and as a reward for completing them, we receive a small reputation boost as well. These quests are the only thing that makes the pacifism challenge possible, and these didn't used to be in the game either. So, uh, thanks Battlestate Games, big props for saving my ass here. Now obviously, some of these quests remain impossible, but there does exist one type of quest where all I need to do is simply find a few randomly selected pieces of loot and return them to the trader requesting them. Normally, this would encourage players to go out into the world and scavenge for loot daily. However, my dumbass had been unwittingly preparing for this all along. You see, at the end of every raid, you need to manually move everything you've gathered into your inventory, where it takes up space until it's either consumed or sold to traders for those sweet, sweet rubles. However, 
Selling your loot also requires you to manually move those items into the trader's inventory. This takes time, and more importantly, uh, effort. And I am very lazy. So, while normally low-level players would be forced to sell all of their loot to traders in order to replace the weapons they were losing in raid, I was selling my guns so I could hoard more loot. Yo, I guess who just got a scab junk box? No way. Yeah. How the fuck did you get that? You sell all your guns? I sold all my guns. They could fucking slurp up our loot. Dude, you're just jealous because I'm rich. I'm gonna shoot you. Yeah, I shoot me too. This is a scav junk box. They are very expensive, but also very useful as they increase the size of your inventory, allowing me to hoard inordinate amounts of junk. Unlike most hoarders, however, my pile of junk was actually worth something. I promise, don't throw any of it out. I need this. As whenever I receive a daily quest to find some random loot, half the time I could just instantly turn in items I already had in my inventory, freeing up the time that I would have had to otherwise spend looking for this loot to go on. Go find more loot anyway. You see, I, I I was going broke doing these quests. How do you go broke completing quests that you don't have to leave the base for? Well, you see, when I get a quest that either requires me to kill some of the native population or for someone that I simply don't need any more reputation with. Sorry, mechanic, I love you, but you're just a little too needy sometimes, you know? You have the option to spend some of your hard-earned money to re-roll the quest, giving you another randomly selected task with a randomly selected trader. However, every time you re-roll the same quest, you have to spend more and more money to re-roll it again. Needless to say, this can get very expensive very fast. And when half of your re-rolls end up being for the exact same task with the exact same trader, sometimes you will spend a million ruples re-rolling quests just to be left with two dailies to kill scavs for Peacekeeper, which if you re-roll again, you will lose reputation for, defeating the entire point of re-rolling them in the first place. Despite that, most of the time, re-rolling would eventually get me quests I could actually complete for traders that I needed rep for. All I really needed was more money for more rolls, like the world's worst fucking gotcha game. What this boils down to is I needed to do more raids for money, which of course I needed to do anyway, because with level 15 came a whole new set of quests for, you guessed it, mechanic. If you're wondering why we're focusing so much on mechanic quests instead of, say, therapist, who, as I previously stated, also gives you a million and one quests to do, let me take some time to go ahead and run you through some of the quests that she gives you real quick. <clears throat> Find me gas analyzers. Find me spark plugs. Find me drugs. Find me money. Find me drugs. Her quests typically require you to go find some semi-rare, often craftable loot, and that is not much of a challenge, so I'm handling that off screen for the most part. And on the rare occasion when she does ask me to go out and actually do something, it's usually not particularly dangerous either. The most dangerous quest I think I ever received from therapist was to go to factory and hide some gunpowder. But even then, she asked me to do it at night when it's safer, because she cares about us, and I care about her. Frankly, without the insane number of boring, yet easy to complete quests that she gives you, I probably wouldn't have been able to get enough XP to complete this challenge. She didn't give me quite the amount of XP mechanic did, but even still, I love her all the same for it. By sheer coincidence, however, she did happen to give me something to do in the exact same place as mechanic on Lighthouse. Lighthouse is similar to Shoreline, being covered in, uh, Shoreline. This map does, however, have something a little special extra, in the form of, uh, a bunch of minefields schizophrenically laid out around the map. Dude, that- Yeah. <laughs> in addition, this map is also home to a special breed of scav, the rogue. The rogues are not feral Russian civilians like all other scavs, however, but instead former American PMCs that have decided that this small square of Russia, contained entirely within the map of Lighthouse, now belongs to them. Because, well, who's gonna stop them? It will shoot any Russian on site, scavs or PMCs alike. However, if you chose the American PMC class during character creation, these rogues are generally friendly and will let you pass by without incident, provided you do not violate the integrity of their no-no zone, that is. Because, so help me God, if they catch you with so much as a pinky toe inside of their invisible rectangle, you're paying for it with your goddamn life. So naturally, Mechanic gave me not one, but two quests to do inside of their territory. Fortunately for me, however, these rogues are so busily guarding their fence line with such intense, unerring focus that, uh, 
no one is actually checking on the buildings themselves here. So if you jump into the window on the border of their territory here, no one's actually guarding the place. Allowing me to find this room to complete corporate secrets, hide a camera over here for broadcast part one, and then duck out without any sort of conflict whatsoever. Honestly, uh, super easy quests. Had a harder time actually getting here than doing the quests themselves. Oh my, oh my god, I'm dead. That's funny. In addition to this, I also had a quest where I had to, and you're not gonna believe this, find something for therapist. But instead of illicit drugs, this time she just wanted me to find some of her missing co-workers. Unfortunately, programming friendly NPCs into the game would take extra work on the developer's part, so uh, the developers took the option that doesn't require them to do that. Yeah, um... I got some bad news about your co-workers. And while all of this questing on Lighthouse is, um, fun, you've pretty much seen all there is to see here. Receive quest, go to location, extract, rinse and repeat. But I was getting that XP I needed to continue upgrading my base. What I wasn't finding, however, was that good ground garbage, that product that I make my living off of, that fat loop. I have people waiting for me to deliver goods. And let me tell you, when Ivan down at the black market tells you that he's expecting his two liters of Jack Daniels, showing up without it isn't an option. Unless, of course, you consider living the rest of your natural life without kneecaps an option, that is. Also, at the rate I was going, I was not on track to get Peacekeeper level four. I don't think I mentioned this up until now, because honestly, I didn't think it was going to be an issue up until now, but uh, we're working on a time limit here. You see, Tarkov works on a wipe system, where every six to seven months, they wipe everyone's saves, take all of your stuff, and start you back at square zero. This is where I was sitting three months in, with 0.22 reputation with Peacekeeper. When you only get 0.01 reputation per quest, this actually sounds like a lot, but remember, I started with 0.2. Three months of playing this game every goddamn day, and I had gotten 0.02 reputation with this goddamn man. Do you know how much reputation you need to max out the base? You need 0.6. And when re-rolling a quest five times in a row just gets you two elimination quests I can't do and costs half a million ruples each, my chances of getting there was looking grim. If I wanted to complete this challenge, I needed more ruples to keep re-rolling daily quests. So it was time for a plan. And unlike most get-rich-quick schemes in Russia, which primarily involve cryptocurrency and insurance fraud, I was going to be doing it the American way, by pulling myself up by the bootstraps, going outside, and getting shot. If you've noticed a the theme thus far, it's probably that almost every map in the game is extraordinarily dangerous. Every map that is, except for one. Woods. That's right, the middle of the goddamn woods is the best possible place in the game to grind for those ruples as a pacifist. Honestly, it's not even that bad of a place to grind if you have a gun. You see, this map is so goddamn big that running into other players just doesn't happen very often, at least not compared to other smaller maps. My typical looting path is to hit up this barn, the houses in this old village by the lake, this camp near the radio tower, the USEC camp, and then head down to the road towards the extract. Oh god! <laughs> And if you spawn near that extract and need to leave on the other side of the map, just run all of that in reverse. Any single one of these places will typically hold enough loot to fill up your entire inventory, provided you're the first one to get there, of course. However, when I say my typical looting path, I do mean in a typical playthrough where I can shoot the scavs. I cannot do that here. This old village and this camp by the radio tower are common scav spawn points. Scavs, however, will never spawn at the USEC camp. So every raid, I would simply spawn in, beeline for the USEC camp, and get out. Oh, hey, drug. You need that for samples. That's not a quest I'm gonna be getting. It's locked behind murder, unfortunately. Shoot. No, I can't do that. We just went over this, Chris. Mm. <laughs> I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like me either. <sighs> Word of caution. This place is uh, covered in fucking mines. But as long as you don't walk up the side of the hill facing the woods, you'll be fine. Yusek Camp easily provided me with almost half of the loot I collected in this run. There is, however, one strategy that exceeds this one. Because after all, if you can't shoot the scavs, you might as well be one. Every time you queue for raid, you have the option to go as either your regular PMC or to go native, playing as a scav yourself. There are several advantages to playing as a scav. First, you will spawn halfway through an already ongoing match, where half of the players have already left through either an extract or from this mortal coil altogether. This leaves you with far less players to deal with. But even better than that, 
is that the other scavs will not shoot you unless you shoot them first. As an extra bonus, for every match you go without shooting a scav, your scav reputation increases. Gain enough, and you can even command other scavs to follow you around to protect you. See, it's okay if people die from these guys, because it's not me doing the shoot. However, there are downsides to being a scav. Chiefly among them that, A, you cannot choose your loadout and will always spawn into a match with a bad gun, which okay. B. Unless it involves just getting loot, nothing you do in raid will count towards any of your quests. And worst of all, C. None of the experience you earn while playing as a scav will count towards your overall player level. For these last two reasons alone, I had wanted to avoid playing as a scav as much as possible. However, seeing as I would have to do about, no joke, 90 raids to just get enough experience for one level at this point in the game, I, uh, I just kind of stopped caring, and honestly, the extra loot I could pick off of the bodies of players without worrying about NPCs was so bountiful and allowed me to reroll so many more dailies than I otherwise could that I think my PMC may have actually ended up gaining more XP from doing those daily quests than he lost from not going into raids himself. Like a corporation exporting its labor abroad, my PMC was now able to sit in his ass all day and profit from the cheap labor of the natives. And the only person who suffers is the player. Me. I'm, I'm, it's me. I'm, I'm the guy who still has to grind all of this himself. But I did know just the place to go do it. Say the line, reserve, Jack. I, uh, I, um, I have my reservations about playing this map. <laughs> uh, this guy fucking sucks. Reserve is a relatively small map, taking place on a compact military base. If you're going to be coming here as a PMC though, do mind the scavs. There is a lot of them. I'll go ahead and highlight the areas on the map where they tend to spawn in for you. So yeah, just stay out of those areas and you'll be fine. If you do manage to survive more than 30 seconds as a PMC, or decide to come in as a scav and fuck around consequence free for 30 minutes however, there's loot everywhere. In this dilapidated train station, in every dorm, in this weather station, and especially in the underground tunnel system. This is where the good shit is. And it is also where the power switch for the only guaranteed PMC extract is as well. So naturally, you're gonna find a lot of bodies here. From PMCs that have already gone through the hard work of gathering half the loot on the map for you before deciding it was time to leave, only to run into other players with the exact same idea. The amount of money I made from this room is unimaginable, and it pretty much funded the entire rest of my playthrough. And outside of a few unlucky encounters, I pretty much never had any major incidents here. With my money issues solved, I could reroll quests to my heart's content. At this point, I had long since gotten all the rep I needed with all the traders except for Peacekeeper, and my rep with him was slowly, but steadily rising. Everything was coming together, and all I needed to do was, you guessed it, more quests to hit that level 37 requirement. Fortunately, literally everyone at this point was giving me quests to do in the same place. The streets of Tarkov. Streets is just downtown Tarkov, the core of the city. And while the city may be named Tarkov, it feels more like fucking Leningrad. Scavs, again, spawn fucking everywhere. But now we have the fun addition that both scabs and players can hide in one of 105 story tall buildings and snipe at you while you walk down the street towards your objective. On top of that, half of the PMC spawn points are on top of each other in the southwest corner of the map, so everyone is just fighting each other from minute fucking one of the raids. So what the fuck am I doing here? I won't bore you with the details of each individual quest, because trust me, they are boring. But when I wasn't getting jump scared by scabs every 12 seconds, oh shit! <laughs> I was going into the most dangerous parts of the map to find dead bodies, flash drives, and hard drives full of snuff fills, all while trying to avoid talking to the locals, whom were extraordinarily interested in what I was doing in what is typically not considered to be a particularly desirable tourist destination. I also had a quest from Therapist, where she just wanted me to safely extract, via a car, again, a benevolent angel of a woman. But with this latest batch of quests, I was done. Not with the game. No, no, no. Just just playing it. For you see, I had finally hit level 30. That's a big level, because it unlocks mechanic level 3, which in turn unlocks the top level generator and workbench upgrades for your base, which themselves in turn unlock the level 3 water cooler and air filtration system, level 3 rest space, which just adds some softcore porn onto the wall, a library consisting of five of the same car manual and a cookbook, 
most literate American, and the scav case, a case which allows me to hire scavs to bring me random loot once every few hours, and all I have to do in return is pay them in alcohol brewed at my brand new booze station, an essential for any Russian household. I didn't even have to go out for loot too often anymore, because all of my monetary needs were being met by an upgraded Bitcoin farm, which I'm not actually sure it's just an in-game upgrade, because every time I'm idling on the matching screen for 10 minutes, my NVIDIA RTX 4090 mysteriously begins to max out. I haven't received any real-life Bitcoin thus far, but the farm did generate north of a million ruples for me every day, so it's worth it. Fun fact, this game used to have the value of every in-game currency tied to the real-world equivalent. Lesson to all game developers out there who want to tie your in-game mechanics to real-world mechanics you have no influence over. Don't do that. It's a cool idea and concept, but when one of your final late game upgrades is to get a Bitcoin farm and the price of Bitcoin crashes 70%, uh, no one really has a reason to play the game anymore. Fortunately, this was no longer the case, so I didn't have to worry about that. I just sat back and watched the money roll in, and then immediately roll back out as I spent all of it re-rolling dailies to try to get something I could do for Peacekeeper. At this point, all of my base upgrades were complete, except for the level 3 Intel station and the level 3 Bitcoin farm, which itself was logged behind the solar farm, which we need level 4 Peacekeeper for. However, just because I couldn't build anything didn't mean progress had come to a stop. In fact, it was accelerating. Since I no longer needed any of the other traders, I was at this point free to re-roll any quests that I got with them, trashing my reputation with them. Sure, this limits the gun parts I have access to in store, but you don't get any more limited than can't use any of them, so it was no real loss. As one final cherry on top, after doing a bit of math, I realized that the 30 plus daily quests I still had to do for Peacekeeper, along with the few extra gunsmith quests mechanic gives you before level 37, would cover all of the XP required to get to level 37. At this point, I had already accumulated 7 scav junk boxes worth of shit that I could instantly turn into traders if they required it, so I largely stopped playing the game outside of coming back once a day, re-rolling dailies until there was something I could instantly complete, and then logging off. It took several months, but slowly, day after day, I inched closer to my goal, until finally, just a few weeks before the end of the wipe, it was done. Level 4 Peacekeeper was at long last unlocked, and I could finally complete my base. Now despite my vast collection of random bullshit, you, believe it or not, cannot make a solar farm out of used cigarettes and burnt out light bulbs. In fact, I would need not one, but two pieces of exceedingly rare loot, exclusive to the most dangerous map in the game. Say the lines, Labs Jack. <laughs> Play Labs? I would, uh, I'd lab to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love this little creep. The Terra Group Laboratory is a secret, underground facility where Russia's top minds once worked diligently to produce the finest performance-enhancing drugs ever concocted in preparation for an Olympic event. However, as society has fallen into disarray and the drugs have fallen into my hands, the labs now lay abandoned, leaving nothing except for the fattest fucking loot your PMC ass has ever seen in their life. The loot is so good, in fact, that they require you to spend one lab's key card in order to get in, and these things can go for several hundred thousand ruples apiece. However, we're not here for the money. I don't even need money at this point. We're only here for two things, the far forward power converter to construct the solar farm, and the far forward GPS for the level 3 intel station. As the name suggests, this level takes place entirely in a single laboratory, consisting of hallways with no cover, walkways that everyone can see you on, and multiple extracts that all require you to accomplish some sort of objective, such as flipping a switch or turning on a power supply before you can leave. Fortunately, there are no scavs on this map. Unfortunately, we have raiders instead. Raiders are the exact same thing as scavs, except they have good weapons, aren't constantly drunk, and are capable of aiming botting you the millisecond you turn around a corner into their hallway, blowing your brains out before you even have a chance to register the fact that they're present. I, uh, I died a lot here. And despite the fact that the far forward devices do in fact spawn on this map, they are, um, 
Still very rare, even for the loot that's normally here. However, I did know where several of the possible spawn locations for them were, and there was a particularly high concentration of those spawn points in this garage along with the office overlooking it. And after a few dozen raids, or uh, about three hours of spawning in, walking around for 45 seconds, only to get shot in the back from the other side of the map with no warning, over and over again, I at long last found the first of my treasures. Since I don't need to sell these on the flea market, that would typically mean I could just pop this into my secure container and live or die, be able to bring it back home. But the good folks over at Battlestate Games fucking despise their player base. So as one final fuck you to the player, for some arbitrary and entirely unexplained reason, far forward items cannot be put into your secure container, meaning if I want them, I need to extract alive with them. This was going to be more difficult than I had imagined. However, I had been playing this game for eight fucking months at this point, and for what I lacked in skill, I sure as hell made up for in persistence. No matter how many times I died, it was only a matter of time until I found my loot again. And as an extra bonus, the car garage here is a possible extract. All you have to do is flip this switch in the office above it and the door opens. Now, there is a chance that raiders will spawn as you do so, but like I said, do this enough times and you will eventually get a run where they don't and you are free to simply walk out, loot in hand. At this point, with only the GPS left to find and a strategy that more or less guaranteed a chance of eventual success, I was feeling good and decided to bring the boys along with me to celebrate. Uh, they almost all said no, because they had all uninstalled the game at this point, except for my boy Sterile Daryl, who agreed to come along with me. Now I'm sure you're asking, doesn't that violate the rule I set up? That I need to do all the hard stuff alone, as to not violate the spirit of pacifism? That's true, bringing him would violate the rule. Unless, of course, he also comes in without a gun. In a way, at long last, allowing me to spread the spirit of peace and tranquility just a tiny bit further through the Tarkov community. And, uh, what, what is that? This is my gun. I'm gonna shoot people. All right, so we brought a gun without telling me, but it doesn't matter as long as we don't actually find the GPS. All right, well, I found the GPS while a guy with a gun was protecting me, but he never used it, and I've already found loot like this alone. So as long as he doesn't actually have to use the gun to protect me as I extract, it's like he was never with me. Shit, they're here. <laughs> I went through all of this just to sully my victory right at the end. This would not stand. I could not come all this way, play hundreds of hours, over eight real-time months, dying hundreds of times, to prove the power of non-violence, just to have a man with a gun get me what I need right at the end. No, it couldn't end like this. And I wasn't going to let it end like this because I was going back. I was going to find another GPS and I was going to extract with it. This time, alone. Because you know what? I may have already proven that it's possible to beat Tarkov without hurting anyone, but you know what else I proved? That you can never trust anyone. Not even your friends. But I don't need them. I never needed them. Because after just a few dozen or so more attempts... You're just gonna run right past them? <gasps> <laughs> hey, friends. No! <laughs> I had my GPS. I extracted, and at long last it was done. The solar farm was mine. The intel bench was mine. And my base was, after eight long months, finally complete without ever doing a single point of damage to another player. If you're wondering why I fired three bullets, uh, th this is pretty much how that happened every single time. Oh, shit, it was tapping in, sorry. Also, to celebrate my triumph, and because I know people will say something if I don't, I even sold off all of my extra loot to buy 50 GPUs on the flea market so that I could max out my Bitcoin farm as well. And with that, my base could no longer be improved. It was maxed out, entirely complete, and finally, all was right in the world. At, at, at least until they wiped my save with the latest patch two days later. God fucking damn it! Ah, well, that's it. Job well done. This video took me uh, a very long time to make, so if you enjoyed it, uh, like, comment, subscribe, hit the, the share button, show everyone on Discord. Uh, just, just hit all the interaction buttons at the bottom of the video. The algorithm loves it when you do that. All right, bye-bye.